Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, ambassador's lecture organized by the Suterbeek program and by the international office of this university. Of course, I would especially welcome our special guest and speaker, His Excellency, United States Ambassador to the Netherlands, Timothy Roas. We feel honored that you visit us, Mr. Ambassador. The fact that you are here today is in line with the special relationship this country, this city, and this university has with the United States. As I see it, this relationship is multifaceted, enriching, and based on mutual understanding and friendship. Let me take you back in time for one example. More than 70 years ago, the Allied forces liberated Nijmegen from the occupation by Nazi Germany. A crucial event that took place during Operation Market Garden was the crossing of the River Waal here in Nijmegen. During this crossing, as you know, 48 soldiers of the US 82nd Airborne Division lost their lives. When a few years ago, the city of Nijmegen decided to have a new bridge across the Waal. The location of this bridge was approximately at the point where the 1944 crossing took place. The project is uh, finished now, and every evening at sunset, 48 special lamps on the bridge are turned on one by one to honor the memory of the 48 soldiers that gave their life for our liberation. So, 70 years after the liberation, their heroic crossing is still gratefully remembered by 48 Lights of Hope. When the bridge was officially opened, two survivors and family members of the deceased were present. The liberation of Nijmegen also brought an end to a dark period in the 90-year history of our university a period in which one of my predecessors, Bernardus Hermesdorf, had the courage to close the university single-handedly. In this way, he made sure that our students would not have to sign the Declaration of Loyalty to our oppressors. The arrival of the Americans gave this university the freedom to develop into the splendid institute of higher education it is today. The number of national and international grants we are awarded reflect our position as one of the top 25 research universities in Europe. For many years now, we have also been elected the best general university in the Netherlands for both master's and bachelor's degree programs. And we organize the biggest summer school in Europe. Yes, I'm bragging, excuse me, but I'm very proud of this university. Let me also remind you that Radboud University cooperates closely with many universities in your country, among them Pennsylvania State University, Stanford University, and a number of them. We collaborate in almost every research field with genetics and heredity, neurosciences and astronomy and astrophysics leading the way. With regard to the last field, astronomy and astrophysics, I would like to mention the honorary doctorate that we will confer to Shinivas Kulkani from the California Institute of Technology on May 28th. Every year, dozens of American students, exchange students, PhD candidates and senior scholars come to Radboud University while students and staff from Nijmegen go to the United States. A recently founded Radboud Excellence Initiative boasts participants from your country, such as Mr. William Duba, present here today, I was told. The film in which you introduce yourself to the Netherlands shows you as an advocate of cancer research. We too stimulate cancer research in all its forms, for example, the Radboud Nanomedicine Alliance is currently looking for ways to reduce or perhaps even prevent the side effects of drug used to treat cancer. 
In the film, you also mention the fact that bicycling is a hobby of yours. No wonder you managed to get here safely on our trip back from uh, the restaurant. As a matter of fact, since we were informed that with regard to bicycling, you could as well be Dutch, we decided to give you presents that bring Radboud University and bicycling together. Um, the goodies are over here somewhere. We want to bring together uh, Radboud University, bicycling, and, and the American ambassador. In here you will find ways to keep dry when it's raining, when you're on your bike. There, is, uh, there are sunglasses when there is uh, sun. There is a hoodie, a real Radboud University hoodie. And of course there is, I'm afraid to say, a very tidy bottle of water. You certainly did not come here to ride on a red Radboud bike and not to receive a present. You have come here to share your views on American-Dutch relations in an international climate uh, that is changing uh, every day at the moment. Afterwards, you will have a discussion with philosopher Paul Bakker. It's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Rector, for inviting me here this evening. If I may briefly put it in Dutch. Het is altijd weer een leuk om in Nijmegen te zijn. Dit is al mijn derde bezoek aan de stad, en zeker niet mijn laatste. En deze zomer hoop ik hier weer te komen om te doen aan de weerdagste als mijn gezinde het toelaat. Mag ik spreken Engels? Okay. Thank you all very much. I'm happy to be here. Um, I've heard all about this university since I've arrived here, and I know that it is the flagship institution in the Netherlands responsible for educating some of the top talent in this country. Radboot is truly cutting edge. As uh, the rector just said, I read that you were rated the most comprehensive university in the Netherlands by the Kozakids Guide. Ten of your master's programs were rated best in their respective fields. Congratulations. I'd like to talk tonight about the U.S.-Dutch relationship and our shared priorities for a changing world. It is an honor to represent President Obama and the American people to one of America's closest friends and allies as ambassador to the Netherlands. Our relationship with the Netherlands goes back 400 years with the establishment of the first Dutch colony in North America at New Amsterdam. Millions of Americans trace their roots back to the Netherlands, including a few prominent ones. President Obama, for one, is a descendant of the pilgrims who first came from Britain to Leiden in 1609, seeking religious freedom, and who later founded the Plymouth Colony of Massachusetts. President Roosevelt's family emigrated from Zeeland. Our eighth president, Martin Van Buren, was a native Dutch speaker, and he would have spoken with a Gelderland accent. His family emigrated to America from Gelderland, from Bormalsen in the Batuwe, uh, Batuva, I'm sorry. Uh, I myself have Dutch roots. All across America, remarkable stories of emigration from the Netherlands are commonplace. We share a cultural heritage to this day, and we share a common respect for diversity and the hope for a better life in both countries. My focus as ambassador is to nurture and strengthen that relationship in the context of four priorities. These are priorities that our two countries share consistent with our joint American and European leadership in a changing world. Those four priorities are a shared responsibility for global peace and security, shared economic prosperity, shared stewardship of the planet, especially in dealing with climate change and sound water management, 
and last but not least, shared values, such as celebrating our cultural and religious diversity. Our security and defense partnership is a cornerstone of Dutch-American cooperation. It's like the oxygen we breathe, not always visible, but necessary for survival. As founding members of NATO, the United States and the Netherlands have helped to secure peace and prosperity on both sides of the Atlantic for seven decades. NATO's collective strength has enabled us to promote our shared values of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law all around the globe. However, the recent crisis in Ukraine has highlighted the political and security stakes in Europe. Fourteen months ago, on the Maidan in Kyiv, and in towns across Ukraine, peaceful protests by ordinary Ukrainians sprang to life. These citizens were fed up with a corrupt regime that no longer represented the will of the people. Together with Germany, France, and the UK, the United States helped to broker talks among then-President Yanukovych, the opposition, and Russia. This led to an agreement that would have ended the violence and would have allowed Yanukovych to stay in office until new elections. But Yanukovych fled, thereby forfeiting his legitimacy. Western-oriented reformers filled the void. Within the framework of Ukraine's constitution and with the overwhelming support of Yanukovych's party, the reformers tried to make good on the promise of the Maidan. But President Putin saw Ukraine's choice as a loss for Russian influence. He manufactured a separatist uprising in Crimea and eastern Ukraine. It was hardly spontaneous or indigenous. Thousands of Russian heavy weapons and troops had poured across the border. As a result, 1.7 million Ukrainians had been forced from their homes, and over 6,000 had died. Why should we, the United States and the Netherlands, care about these actions on Europe's eastern frontier? For one, we know all too well that the chaos unleashed by this Russian-manufactured crisis has cost nearly 200 Dutch citizens their lives when MH17 went down in eastern Ukraine last summer. But Russians' actions also obstruct two very fundal, fundamental interests we share. One, our long-term effort to build a Europe that is whole, free, and at peace. Europe's great achievement since World War II has been its extraordinary progress toward this goal. But if a large country boarding four EU members is dismembered, prevented by an outside power from pursuing the future that its people have clearly chosen and at war, then our entire post-war European project falls apart. Two, defending the global rules-based system. We all have a stake in upholding rules, stipulating that borders and the territorial integrity of states cannot be changed by force. If such rules do not stand, countries around the world will feel emboldened to advance their interests at the barrel of a gun. So long as Russia continues to ignore its commitment to these agreements, the United States, together with the Netherlands and our other European allies, will continue to respond with a unified effort. We will promote international support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. We have isolated Russia politically. Our sanctions are working. Russians' inflation has reached 10 to 15 percent. Nearly $150 billion in capital has fled Russia last year, and $130 billion has disappeared from Russians' foreign currency reserves to prop up the ruble. Russia's credit rating has been downgraded to junk, and the drop in oil prices has reinforced the weakness of Russia's economic model. These are the unfortunate consequences of Putin's choices. The United States would prefer to see Russia become a strong global partner. We want Russia's partnership in building peace and security, both in Russia's region and worldwide. We have sought to open doors to Russia's greater integration into European and Atlantic structures. The United States alone has spent more than $20 billion since 1992 to help Russia strengthen and open its economy, prepare for entry into the World Trade Organization, improve public health, promote clean and open governance, advance non-proliferation, and forge closer ties with NATO. We reject the narrative of grievance one often hears in Moscow today, 
that the United States really wants a weak Russia. Nothing could be further from the truth. What we have always wanted, what we still want, is a strong, democratic Russia that respects rule of law at home and abroad and its neighbor's sovereignty. Indeed, a weakened Russia is not the sort of partner we need to tackle global challenges. And the global challenges we face are formidable, extending well beyond the borders of Europe. ISIL is committing horrific atrocities in Iraq and Syria, including rounding up and executing Yazidi and Assyrian Christians simply because of their faith and selling women and girls like animals in open auctions. They have shown that they're an enemy to America, to Europe, and to our partners in the Middle East. Dozens of countries, including the Netherlands, are contributing to our coalition's long-term comprehensive effort to degrade and ultimately destroy this scourge. For years, we faced the prospect of a nuclear-armed Iran. Yet, through multilateral sanctions and tough, principled democracy and diplomacy, we were able to bring Tehran to the negotiating table to work toward a comprehensive plan aimed to prevent the country from acquiring a nuclear weapon. The deal is not done and may never get done, but we have an historic opportunity to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons in Iran and to do so peacefully with the international community firmly behind us. The list of challenges goes on and on, and we don't have time to get into all of them tonight. But these examples demonstrate that we cannot take our shared security for granted. The United States, the Netherlands, and our EU and NATO partners are in this together. It's a shared responsibility. Investment in our security is crucial. It is necessary. A prosperous and peaceful future for new generations depends on it. For we know that it is prosperous free nations that ultimately attain peace and security, and it is peace and security that allow our economies to flourish. And this brings me to my second priority, our shared prosperity. We are trading nations, and we have invested in each other's countries for centuries. My predecessor, John Adams, the first American ambassador to the Netherlands and the second president of the United States, signed the Treaty of Amity and Commerce in 1782 and negotiated America's first vital loan of five million guilders from the Netherlands. And the Dutch have been with us ever since, investing in the banks, the railroads, the canals, and the infrastructure that built my country. Today, the United States invests about $685 billion in the Netherlands, making us the largest investor here. More than 2,100 American companies have made the Netherlands their home in Europe. This economic partnership has improved the lives on both sides of the Atlantic for centuries. But we are not content to stand still. We continue to look for ways to innovate and improve. And the Dutch are no slouches either. With a relatively small but vibrant population of 17 million people, the Netherlands is the third largest direct investor in the United States. It used to be the first, by the way. It slipped a couple notches. Its $275 billion worth of investment supports 685,000 jobs in America. And the Netherlands is a leader when it comes to international business. Rotterdam is Europe's logistical centerpiece. Seven decades ago, Western Europe was devastated by war. Rotterdam was in ruins. Today, it is Europe's largest port. That is the unassailable power of trade. It is a force for good. Today, we have an enormous opportunity to boost our transatlantic trade and investment, not just between the Netherlands and the United States, but between the United, I mean, the United States and the European Union, the two largest economies in the world. I am speaking, of course, of the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, which is currently under negotiation between the United States and the EU. This groundbreaking new trade partnership can be for our economic health what NATO has been to our shared security for 65 years, a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. The U.S.-EU trade relationship is the largest in the world, accounting for nearly half of global GDP. We trade about $1 trillion in goods and services each year. We invest nearly $4 trillion in each other's economies. All of that supports about 13 million jobs on both sides of the Atlantic. 
Economic studies on TTIP show that a comprehensive agreement could increase real U.S. and EU GDP and exports by tens of billions of dollars and support hundreds of thousands of new jobs. We know that small and medium-sized enterprises, or SMEs as we call them, are the backbone of the American and European economies and are the engine for job growth. SMEs that export tend to grow faster, create more jobs, and pay higher wages than similar businesses that do not. We want to eliminate tariffs and remove non-tariff barriers in order to make it easier for SMEs to expand their operations across the Atlantic. The ninth round of TTIP negotiations is happening this very week in New York. The negotiations have been conducted in an open and transparent manner, the most transparent of any trade negotiation in history. In addition to frequent meetings with stakeholders, we pause in the middle of each negotiation to interact directly with the public in an open forum. We provide regular public updates during and after each round, and we've made our negotiating objectives public. One of my top goals here as ambassador is to partner with the Dutch to get this deal done. There are sensitivities in politics on both sides. Despite the potential for a high standards agreement that will lead to GDP and job growth on both sides of the Atlantic, public criticism of TTIP seems to be gaining momentum. The Netherlands, as a tra traditional exporting nation, knows the value of external trade to economic growth. So if we stay focused on our shared commitment to commerce and prosperity, we can achieve the kind of high standard comprehensive agreement that the global trading system is looking for us to develop. Excuse me. My third priority, shared stewardship of the planet means taking care of our environment and tackling climate change. This is especially true today, Earth Day. I don't know if you know it, but today we celebrate the 45th anniversary of Earth Day, which was started in 1970 in the United States. I can remember that day very, very well. And President Nixon, of all people, was a, uh, was a significant sponsor and supporter of Earth Day, and as a result of his actions, we created the Environmental Protection Agency. We passed the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. And those laws are still with us today, and they provide a huge, huge uh, motivation for keeping the environment clean and fighting climate change. The world is getting warmer. Consider this. 14 of the warmest years on record occurred in the last 15 years since 2000. Last year was the warmest year on record. At the UN Climate Summit in September, President Obama reminded us that for all the immediate challenges we are working to address, terrorism, instability, inequality, disease, there is one issue that will define the contours of this century more dramatically than any other, and that is the urgent and growing threat of climate change. No country is immune to the impacts of climate change, and no country can meet this challenge alone. We must work together to reduce carbon pollution, prepare for climate impacts, and develop long-term solutions to meet our energy needs. The work you are doing here in Helderland to move from fossil fuels to a bio-based economy is a step in the right direction. America is also doing better. We attained a landmark agreement with China to cut net greenhouse gas emissions 26 to 28% below 2005 levels by 2025. And for the first time, China agreed to peak its CO2 emissions and to increase the non-fossil fuel share of all energy to 20% by 2030. Following that historic announcement, the European Union put forward an ambitious goal to cut emissions 40% by 2030. This is the kind of action we need to inject momentum into the global climate negotiations. One of our top priorities in the coming months is to reach a new climate agreement in Paris this December. We know that an agreement will not completely eliminate the threat of climate change, but it's a vital first step. And we are fortunate to have an experienced partner in the Netherlands when it comes to dealing with climate and weather. We learned after Hurricane Katrina 
that when you want to build coastal resilience to keep water at bay, you turn to the Dutch. After Hurricane Sandy, President Obama created a task force to find a way to rebuild those communities, a strategy that could serve as a model for other coastal areas around the nation. Senior Dutch official Hank Ovink joined our task force and played a key role in its success. Hank launched a design competition called Rebuild by Design, where 150 teams made up of experts in a variety of disciplines, architecture, urban design, engineering, ecology, and communications, put forward ideas to rethink developments in the areas affected by Sandy. In the end, six very innovative proposals were selected, four of which were led by Dutch firms. I meet with Hank periodically to, re to discuss water management and his efforts at Rebuild by Design, and I was very happy to learn that the Dutch government appointed him as the first ever Special Envoy for International Water Affairs for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. This example of our shared stewardship shows that by working together, we can move toward our broader goal of global sustainability, the need to design in ways that take ecology, economy, infrastructure, and weather uncertainty into account. Climate change threatens American, Dutch, and global security. It is likely to expand economic and social inequality and will increase competition and conflict over agricultural, marine, and water resources. It can result in the massive displacement of people, including those whose livelihoods depend on these resources. But climate change also presents us with opportunities, opportunities to advance new technologies, grow our economies, and strengthen our communities. Efforts here in Gelderland to move to a bio-based economy and to become energy neutral by 2050 are the kinds of initiatives that will make our communities more resilient to emerging challenges like rising sea levels and extreme heat. Finally, the foundation of our shared responsibility, prosperity, and stewardship is our unwavering commitment to our shared values. Because our ideals and values are so deeply and historically intertwined, we are able to address together many challenges that impact both of our societies. Things like immigration, integration, cultural, religious diversity. It was here in Europe where, through centuries of struggle, war and enlightenment, repression and revolution, a particular set of ideals began to emerge. The belief that through conscience and free will, each of us has the right to live as we choose. The belief that power is derived from the consent of the governed and that laws and institutions should be established to protect that understanding. These ideals inspired America's founding fathers, many of whom had Dutch roots. They incorporated these values into the founding documents that still guide our society today. These ideals have been tested over centuries. Through world wars that ravaged Europe, America's own civil war, and our civil rights movement, the singular tragedy of the Holocaust, the deeply flawed but ever-present notion that by virtue of faith, color, ethnicity, or wealth, some people or groups of people are inherently superior to others. Yet our shared values and ideals have stood the test of time. Because our ideals and our values are so deeply and historically intertwined, we are able to address together many challenges that affect both of our society. The results of our steadfast pursuit of these values are vibrant, open, and diverse 21st century societies on both sides of the Atlantic that we can be very proud of. I have been bringing together people here in the Netherlands with differing opinions to discuss how we can work together in the spirit of the Dutch-American friendship to embrace our diversity as a source of national strength. Indeed, history teaches us that the fair to uphold these rights and freedoms can actually fuel violent extremism. As President Obama has said many times, no children are born hating, and no children anywhere should be educated to hate other people. There should be no more tolerance of so-called clerics who call upon people to harm innocents because they're Jewish or they're Christian or they're Muslim. It is time for a new compact among the civilized peoples of the world to eradicate war 
at its most fundamental source, and that is the corruption of young minds by violent ideology. Often it is local communities, family, friends, and neighbors, and faith leaders who are best able to identify and help disillusion individuals before they succumb to extremist ideologies and engage in violence. That's why the United States government is committed to working with communities in America and around the world to build partnerships of trust, respect, and cooperation. I believe that to preserve our shared values and to progress in our human rights agenda, we must understand and learn from one another. We must respect differing opinions and the different choices people make and embrace the richness and diversity of our two great democracies. We must also be open to criticism. We must be willing to put ourselves in the shoes of others, to take a stand and speak up when our values and our ideals are threatened. When we see policies that no longer achieve our intended results, we must be willing to reconsider them. U.S. policy toward Cuba is a recent case in point. Our policy for decades was rooted in the best of intentions, especially during the Cold War, in which together we did prevail. But today, it has had little effect beyond providing the Cuban government with a rationale for restrictions on its own people. We believe in democracy and human rights for the Cuban people. A change in policy, though controversial, will one day seem obvious. Cuban Americans, indeed, are now being reunited with their families. And through these exchanges, a younger generation of Cuban, Cuban Americans has increasingly questioned an approach that does more to keep Cuba closed off from an interconnected world. I'm almost done. As we think about U.S.-Dutch relations in the context of some of the global challenges I have described, we recognize that we cannot confront them alone. We must stay committed to our shared priorities, security, prosperity, stewardship, and values, to confront these challenges together. That is my challenge as ambassador, and that is my challenge to all of you. Thank you, Vail, and happy Earth Day. <laughs>